We want to also welcome those who are watching online today from literally, it's kind of cool, around the world. Come on, can we show some people some love today for joining in? Oh, you can do better than that. Come on, show them some love this morning. And uh, we're so glad that you're watching, tuning in today here at High Point. We're so honored that you would be part of High Point. What's going on? I love what God is doing in our church family. And uh, we are in week two of our series entitled Fully Alive. And uh, we are journeying through the book of Romans. Romans is a meaty book of the Bible. And uh, woo, as a pastor, it sometimes is like, okay. It's like the Mount Everest, okay? Give you an equivalent of preaching through a book of the Bible. That is what we're doing right now, which we're journeying together. It's got a lot of fun. Have you ever given your uh, child non-diluted apple juice before? It's like a live action emoji. Ah, crazy, intense, jarring to a certain extent. And uh, well, I remember when we, we gave our boys, uh, accidentally gave our boys non-diluted apple juice one time, they, their little faces puckered up. Ah. And uh, because what, the sugar, the intensity, they're not used to to digesting something. So Morgan would dilute it so it wouldn't be so sweet. But I gotta be honest, I didn't dilute it so it wouldn't be more sweet, I diluted it to save money. (laughs) That's the honest truth. You could make a bottle of apple juice last for a whole month with three little boys that way. Why am I saying that? Now our Americanized culture, Christianity, per se, there has been an attempt to dilute the message of Jesus to make it more palatable, to make it easier and more digestible, to make it not so intense. And in return, some purposely avoid difficult or hard themes in the Bible for fear of offending somebody, for making somebody uncomfortable, uh, we see so many Christians abo- Christian books about love and peace and we preach about happiness and we, we talk about a, abundant living in our small groups and we talk about forgiveness and freedom and all of those things are so, so important. They're critical parts of our faith, but they're not the only parts of our faith. And these things are important, but today I... I refuse to preach a watered down gospel that makes some people uncomfortable. And I quite honestly, as an individual, I will give an an account for my life and following Jesus, but I will also give an account for what I teach and what I preach. I will give a, 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 a harder account for what I preach and teach and guide you all in than, than anything. So, As a pastor, I cannot overlook and I will not overlook difficult topics because I believe it dishonors the very heart of God and it cheapens the grace that he gives. So what am I preaching on? I'm like teeing this whole thing up. Some of y'all get your running boots on. We're going into murky waters, baby. Here we go. I'm preaching on the wrath of God today. The 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 wrath of God. Now, some of you, before you write me off and walk away from the conversation, I want you to write this down, write this down. To fully appreciate the depths of God's grace, we must understand the weight of his wrath. To understand the depths of God's grace, we must understand the weight of his wrath. It's a weighty subject. It's a strong subject. It's honestly a difficult one, but you can never fully appreciate. It's like someone giving you something that you didn't have to pay for. Someone else sacrificed, like when you get a gift at Christmas, someone's worked hard for that money. Someone was thoughtful, someone was intentional, but you never fully appreciate it. Why is it that our kids don't appreciate everything that we give them? Because they didn't have to work for it. It was given to them. In the same way, sometimes we, struggle to comprehend the depths of God's grace because we don't comprehend and understand what it costs to give us that grace. And so today we're journeying into Romans chapter one, verses 18 through 19. If you have your Bibles, you can open up there this morning, Romans chapter one, verses 18 and 19. Here's what was written to the church in Rome. The wrath of God 
is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what be, may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. You know, some struggle to grasp this biblical construct of wrath because we've clung to an idea of God being this loving and kind and patient and gentle and we think about scriptures like first john chapter 4 verse 9 god is love caleb god is love and we think about passages like psalms 145 where it says the lord is gracious and he's compassionate pastor caleb he's slow to anger and he's he's rich and loaded with love and god is all of those things that is why the wrath and the, and the forgiveness of sins is so powerful because we understand that God is love and he is slow to anger and he is great, rich in mercy and he is overflowing with patience. And that is what makes it so good. And, and we think about the wrath of God and it makes us uncomfortable sometimes because we think how can a loving God have frustrations or anger or uh, there, 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 there's a difficulty, but you must not forget both humans and God have wrath. But we do too. Sometimes, sometimes wrath is in the human context justified. Others, it is not. There's a vast difference between the wrath of God and the wrath of man. I want you to write this down this morning that God's wrath is holy and always justified. Man's is never holy and rarely justified. God's wrath is holy and justified and always justified. And man's is never holy and rarely justified. God is always just and always holy. Ours is rarely just and seldom holy. I, I think about times where there are, there are times where someone's anger and frustration is justified. You ever have moments like that in your life? No? Can I tell you one of mine? Thank you. I remember when the twins were born, it, we have three kids. And when the twins were born, it was uh, an interesting season to say the least. We had three little boys under 18 months old. And besides the payments for diapers and formula, there was this thing called sleep that was non-existent in our house. And we, I remember one night feeding Levi in the middle of the night. I was, I was on duty every night because when there's two, you get to double dip. You get to help every time. Otherwise, no one sleeps at all. And so I remember I was feeding Levi and then I woke up and Levi was on the floor. Now, some of y'all just judge me. Some of the moms are like, oh, I'm calling CPS. This is a long time ago. Okay, that's how the doctor responded when we told the truth in the office too. Yeah. They <laughs> but my, he's okay. But I remember what is etched in my mind, what is ingrained in my spirit for all of eternity is my wife coming over the top of that bed in slow motion, what did you do? <laughs> completely justified. Completely, completely justified. When I tell you it wasn't my finest moments in life, I couldn't stay awake that day. Other days it was like, I just, I was just, lo I was losing a little bit. And I was talking to somebody on the phone that I care for, that I respect, that I love. And I just, trying to show you my humanity a little bit and the sense of I'm a, just a person just like you. And, and I was saying some stuff on the phone and they're like, Caleb, you don't even know what you're saying right now. And my response to them was, I know exactly what I'm saying right now. Woo! What's the point? Is that our anger, our emotional outbursts are nothing like the wrath of God. They are not the same. 
The, the, the wrath of God is not like your crazy ex-girlfriend who brought all the stuff that you gave to her and your relationship and throws it back in your face and says, look what you did. You only know that's funny if you've ever experienced it. You know, it's just like, <laughs> but it's not God saying, look at all the bad things that you did. You should feel guilty for how you, no. God's wrath is justified. It is different. It is not like a lack of self-control. So what is it then? Let me walk through this very quickly. In the Old Testament, we see the wrath of God as a divine response to human sin and disobedience. We see the word uh, wrath first used in Exodus chapter 22, when God warns Israel of mistreating sojourners who were around them, mistreating other people. That's the first time we see this word actually used. And most of the time in the Old Testament, the wrath of God was connected when other people were worshiping other idols, when idolatry was in place. And, and, and in most occasions, there was a divine wrath when someone chose other, something other than God. What's the point? The point is to understand that our God is a jealous God and he will not tolerate us worshiping anything else but him. Amen. And so we see that response to an in intentional decision to turn away from God. Then we see this perpetuated through the New Testament. In fact, Jesus talks about the wrath of God in Matthew chapter five, verse 22, when he's describing hell as a place of hell and fire. Now, some people, when they read the Bible, they're like, oh, that's not literal, that's metaphorical. Okay, serious question. What is a metaphor used then? What's a metaphor good for? It's to describe something that is incomprehensible or something that you cannot understand because you've never experienced it. So if, if hell describes, even if it's metaphorical, which I believe it's literal, even if it's metaphorical, what is it describing? Hell's a fire? I don't want it. So whether we see and we understand, but why even talk about the wrath of God? Because you can never understand and grasp the depths of God's grace until you understand the weight of his wrath of what we deserve, but he took for us in our place. That's what it is. You know, God, God's wrath is a righteous wrath, a holy anger for sin, the mistreating of others, for knowing what is right and still doing wrong. For he is a just God, meaning that he demands justice for what is wrong. He demands justice for what is wrong. We are a people of justice. We are a people in the United States, we are a people of justice. In fact, we have a whole court system. We have a pledge of allegiance that ends with justice and liberty for? We are a people of, of justice. See, we think that our justice is our way, but God's justice is very different. Now, I want you, I want you to process this. Imagine Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler is caught alive after all of his heinous acts and brought before a judge for the things that he did. It takes the, the lawyers nine hours to read every count that is against Hitler and everything that he had done against humanity and people. And there is a reading of everything that he had done wrong. And, and in this moment, the judge, after completing the reading of, of these crimes, if he were to say, I see what you've done, you've, you've murdered millions of people, but I think you've learned your lesson just by getting caught. So I'm gonna let you go. And he slaps the gavel on the table, not guilty. What arises in our hearts when we consider such a scenario? The emotion is outrage because of injustice. We know the verdict is not just because it feels intolerable to us. Evil requires an equivalent punishment. And we inherit that sense of justice from the very heart of God. We want justice and liberty from all, for all, because that is the very heart of God, which we are created in the very image of God. Are you tracking with me today? 
So our desire for justice in our society and our lives, and some people are like, no, I'm not gonna say anything. Okay, that's fine. Most of the time, those people that say there's justice, there's no justice, don't say anything until a loved one is wronged. So justice is something that all of us innately have on the inside of us, but instead of getting the punishment and the anger of God, God actually sent his only son, Jesus, to take the punishment, the appropriation of our sins. It's not only the freedom that he gives, but he also gives us the, 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 the turning away from the frustration and the anger of God because he loves us and that is his grace. That is his taking our place and not only the punishment for our sin, but the full wrath of God upon him. And to fully appreciate the depths of God's grace, we must understand the weight of his wrath. Here's what Romans 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 23 and 24 says. For everyone has sinned. Who sinned? Everyone. everyone. We all fall short of God's glorious standards, yet God in his, in his grace, God's in his grace freely makes us right in his side. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sin. I want you to write this down, that Jesus doesn't dampen the intensity of sin. Jesus took the penalty for our sin. Amen. He doesn't make it less intense. No, he just took it all for us and he, he took our place. He, was the pen, he took the penalty and the punishment. He took the sin and the shame. He took it all on the cross. Not only did he take the penalty, he turned the wrath of God away from us and to himself because he is a just God that demands a, a price to be paid for what is not right. So in our journey with God, we must understand that he chose us. He chose us. Growing up, I really, I had a, a major anger problem. And you know, some of you are thinking, man, Pastor Caleb, you're messed up. Well, I know you are, so I might as well be too. You know, like I don't, it's, why, why do I share stories like this? It's because when you talk about something, sometimes people will position a pastor in a certain way, but in reality, I have to face God just like you do. So when I preach a heavy message like this, I want you to bring the reality. It's not just for you, it's for me as well. And so growing up, I had a major, major, major anger problem. And so much so that when I struck out at baseball, which I didn't want to strike out a lot, but when I did, my helmet was flying through the air like a bird in the sky. My fists were flying in the locker rooms, constantly fighting whoever would fight me. And like my hands were like caffeinated hummingbirds. Come on, <laughs> all the time. And you don't see that now because of the grace of God. But in, the good, in his goodness, I, I, was just, I had just this unbridled competitiveness that was not healthy. And it caused me just to lose control in my life. And uh, because I have a loving dad, he sat me down and he said, hey, listen, um, you have an issue. You have an issue. And if you don't get a hold of this issue, you, this issue, and you don't submit this issue to God, you're gonna open up agonizing pain in your life. And you're gonna miss out on opportunities. You're gonna, you're gonna underlive your potential. You need to address this. And because I have a loving father, he allowed me to have free will. But my decisions to have free will also have consequences. He brought it to my attention, allowed me to experience the freedom as an adult to present the consequences of my actions and allowed me to make a decision. Thankfully, I made a decision to submit it to God and allow God to start the process of healing in my own heart because most of the things that we see exterior are interior issues. And I was on a healing journey of wholeness and, and I could have suppressed that conversation and rejected it and paid the price for it but because my loving father sat me down, brought it to my attention and said, hey, this is something that needs to be resolved, then in return allows me to walk on this journey of freedom that I now know because I have a loving father, but I could have paid the price for the things that I was doing, but I didn't have to because someone was willing to say something. 
And God does the same for you and I, that he brings things to our attention and says, this is not right. And the consequences for these things are sin, are destruction, is the wrath of God, is hell. And we don't, in our world, a lot of times we, we're like, well, God is kind. And, you know, we, we have a choice to make. <laughs> it's either the grace of God or the wrath of God. One of these things is not like the other. It seems like a no-brainer. Why would anyone choose the wrath of God over the grace of God? It's because sin is seductive and convinces you that your way is better than God's. That what you're doing really doesn't matter. It doesn't really, doesn't really push the limits. And oh, it's just, you know, just a little freedom. It's just, you know, I, I, what, what does that matter? Why would anybody choose the judgment of God over the grace of God? Because the enemy is a liar. He's a liar. And in our response, this is what Paul is stating that God made himself known and it was plain to people. They were rejecting God and suppressing the truth because their ways were better. And when we choose sin, we express contempt for God's character, calling bad things good. And that's why Paul is saying that ungodliness and wickedness is perpetuated by those who are suppressing the truth. So where is the response? What is the hopeful part of this? Some of you are thinking, man, Caleb, this whole fully alive series making me feel like I'm fully not so alive. But here's the good news. In uh, Psalms chapter one, chapter 112 of Psalms, sorry, verses one and two, it says, how joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. So what should we do in response to understanding the weight and the wrath of God that there must be a, there must be a penalty for our sins and that Jesus took our place and that he extends grace in the midst of it all? What should we do? We should, number one, we have to live with the fear of the Lord. We live with the fear of the Lord. Growing up, I don't know about you, but have any of you ever watched the Kirk Cameron movies? And I used to run in my house terrified when I couldn't find my, my parents. I was like, man, my dad, if anybody's going to heaven, I know my dad is. And I just ran through the house. The trumpet has sounded and I didn't hear it. <laughs> like I just fearful of the return. I was afraid, genuinely afraid. But there is a difference between being scared and any parents, good parents in here, scare your spouse or your kids all the time jumping out from behind doors, ah, no. Y'all are really judging me today. I feel like, you know, I only got to stand before God for the wrath of God. Y'all like, I don't want to. But I scare, scare, scaring your kids is kind of fun. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes a lot of people think that God is around the corner ready to gotcha. No, that is not, it's not how God functions. God brings light to darkness. He brings hope to brokenness and we live with the healthy fear of the Lord. Here's what John Brevere said. If you desire the praise of man, you will fear man. If you fear man, you will serve man uh, for you will serve what you fear. You'll serve what you fear. Believers are not to be scared of God. There's no reason to be scared of him because we have promised, we have a promise that nothing can separate us from his love. We have his promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. All of these promises still stand true. Fearing God means having a reverence for him and that greatly impacts the way that we live. That greatly impacts the way that we live. The fear of God is respecting him, obeying him, submitting to his discipline and worshiping him with awe. It's this awe, it's this respect. And here's what Proverbs chapter three, verse seven says, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs chapter nine, verse 10, fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Until we understand and develop a, a reverent fear of him, we cannot truly understand wisdom. And true wisdom comes from only understanding who God is and that he is holy and he is just and he is righteous, that he, he is all of those 
things, a healthy reverence, a healthy respect for God. Number two, the passage tells us has a joy and delighting in the oh, obeying his commands. So here's what we should do as our response. We need to delight in obeying his commands. Delight in obeying his commands. Mo, most people see commands and guidance as dreadful, rules dreadful. I wanna do my, I wanna do what I wanna do. Do it when I wanna do it. No, listen, rules are not to hinder you, they're to protect you. I remember having a group of people at my house. There were way too many kids there. It's like, you know, there's like six adults and 30 kids. I'm like, oh my goodness, dude. And I we're sitting there at the table and uh, I see a kid climb up on the, on the picnic table on our deck and get up onto the ledge of the, of the stuff. And they're standing there and I did what every good parent would do with the other parents sitting there. I said, you get down from there right now. Because I have a responsibility. I have a, it's, it's my house. And I have a responsibility to ensure that my homeowner's insurance doesn't go up. <laughs> Some of you are like, you're such a jerk. Okay, that's fine. In all seriousness, I have a responsibility to help that child because that child has no understanding of the pain that's the other side of what is going on. They have no understanding of how far the fall is. They have no understanding of the brain bleed that is on the other side of falling 12 feet onto a piece of concrete head first. We wonder why there's a lot of brain bleed in our world today. Not just physically, but I'm talking emotionally. It's because people think that they can walk on any ledge that they want without any penalty of what is on the other side. And a just God cannot allow their children to do something that could harm them. And so when we think about God, we need to take delight that God wants to protect us from what could hurt us. A God of love must hate anything that harms those that he loves. A God of love must take action to protect the innocent against the malicious. A God of love means business when he decides and declares that something is off limits and should not be participated in. Because moral, morality is not, not a fluid cultural matter. Morality is not a fluid changing. There are absolutes right and wrong. Come on, we're in church. I figured I'd get a lot bigger, amen. There are absolutes right and wrong. Process this with me. For if the more, if, if morality was just a, a consensus of what Americans think or European people think, then slavery would have been right three years, 300 years ago, but it's still, it was wrong then and it's still wrong today. Morality is not fluid. It's not based on what the crowd says. It's based on truth of who God is and what God says. For in this passage, people begin to worship other idols. They begin to expose themselves to worship other things. If you go on to read in the second part of this passage, it goes on to say that those who worshiped idols and wherever God is not, sin takes its place. Not only did they start to worship idols, they started to engage in homosexuality where men were enraged with men and women were enraged with women. Not only is that sinful, it just biologically doesn't make sense. And when you think about what, the, whoa, some of you are like, whoa, whoa, listen. Here's what you have to understand. Wherever God is not, sin will enter its place. And we wonder in our world why we got all this mess going on. It's because we've made much of our opinion and little of God's truth. And so we need to stand on God's truth. God's goodness, God's goodness is so good to us. Even when we deserve wrath, God gives us grace. Where we deserve punishment, God gives us mercy. And that is his love towards us. When God is suppressed, 
Sin fills the gap, but what are we, why, why is this even important? We need to take delight in the protection of God. To take delight in Psalms 112, it talks about when you ha- what happens when you live in the confines. Like if you're, if you're on the road and they're doing E470 construction, it's like E470 never stops construction. Like it's always under construction. They have these things that are barriers to keep you from things that could hurt you. But often there's not just one barrier, there's another barrier so that you don't get close to the ledge of what could really hurt you. So when you think about it, when you're driving on that road, there are multiple layers of protection from keeping you from falling off the side. And the same is true with the heart of God, that he creates barriers to protect us, not to keep us from something that he wants us to have. No, it is protection. And there is joy in protection. And when we choose that protection of obeying his commands, taking delight in his commands, what the resolve is, is generational blessing. What does the wrath of God have to do with generational blessing? It's having a proper understanding of God and a proper understanding of man allows us to understand the very heart of God. And when we delight in taking, com- taking his commands and living by his commands, there is generational blessings. Here's what it says in Psalms chapter 112. Uh, it goes on to say that children will be successful everywhere. People who obey and take joy in delighting in his commands, that, that great success for our kids comes when we fear the Lord and delight in obedience. These are not my words, these are God's words. So even if you aren't eager to do it for yourself, do it for your kids. An entire generation will be blessed. A lot of people think that generational blessings come from programs and processes and persistence, but generational blessings are not complicated like we've made them. They come when we live in obedience and surrender to God. And so when we surrender our ways and say, God, not my way, your way, we not only receive the grace of God, but we also have generational blessing to come on the other side. So how do we understand and how do we avoid the wrath of God? We live with the fear of the Lord. We delight in his commands and we choose Jesus. We choose Jesus as the worship team is coming. We choose Jesus. We choose Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone. If it were not for Jesus and his goodness and his righteousness, the wrath of God would be, would be our eternity. But because of the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus, he gives us new life. Jesus doesn't dampen the intensity of sin. He took the penalty for our sin. And you can never appreciate the depths of his grace without understanding the weight of his wrath. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? I just want us to take a moment of uh, reflection today. Would you just close your eyes? I promise nobody's gonna do anything weird or I always have to preface that because I'm like, I'm closing my eyes, what's gonna happen? I just, so you're not distracted and you can focus on the Lord. Why is it important to focus? Why is this the most important part of the service? Because I want you to understand what all God's done for you. More we deserve punishment and sin. He gave us grace. And oh, the grace of Jesus, the blood of Jesus sets us free. I love the old song, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me white as snow. If you're here this morning and I just want you to contemplate in your own heart where you are with God. And If you need him in your life today, it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be hard. You can make a decision to follow him and receive that grace. Seems like a simple response, it is. And if you need him, I, I, I just want you to say, Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness. And I want to follow you.
the greatest way to, re to understand and remember the grace of God is to take communion together. So this morning when you came in, you were given communion elements. You could grab those and the ushers are gonna make their way down the aisle and turn back around this morning. If you didn't get them, you could just wave them down in the, in the aisles there. But if you wanna wonder God's care and heart for us, communion reminds us of God's love. For it was the bread that Jesus took on the night that he was betrayed. And it represents his body being broken and beaten and torn and shredded. And oh, it's so graphic, Caleb. You can never understand the depths of God's grace. You can never understand the depths of God's grace. No mind can comprehend. I think the lie of the enemy is that no one understands what you're going through. Oh, but God understands. There is one who has taken the beating so that we could be healed. And so today, Lord, we take this piece of bread and Lord, we thank you for your mercy. In your own words, can you just thank the Lord for, his, for his, his grace? Lord, we just thank you for the body that was beaten for us. And we choose to remember how good you are. Lord, we know that this represents your body that, could be, that, that was broken so that we could be healed. When we take this, we say thank you. In Jesus' name, let's take the bread together. Then he took the cup on that same night. He says, this cup represents the forgiveness of sins, the covering of our wrongdoing. Every time we take this cup, every moment that we gather together as believers and we take this cup, it is a reminder, it is a reminder of his divine love. Father, we thank you for the cup today that represents the forgiveness that you've given all of us if we choose to follow you. And so this morning, we just thank you and we remember your sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's take the cup together. We just take a moment and just thank the Lord in our own words. Come on, can you just lift your hands as a sign of surrender this morning and just say, thank you, God, for your goodness. Lord, we thank you. Come on, the scripture tells us to, to open up our hearts and our mouths and just say, thank you. Come on, Lord, we thank you today for your undeserved mercy and grace that you've given to us. God, we thank you for taking our place. God, we thank you, Lord, for the freedom and the forgiveness that the resurrection of Jesus gives us today. And Lord, we just declare that, that you are good, that you're righteous, that you're holy. And Lord, we, come on church, would you open up your mouths and just thank, say thank you in your own words. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that you bring, for the hope that you bring, the peace that you bring. Lord, we declare that there is none like you. And Lord, we choose to remember that, oh, we deserve the wrath of God, but you gave us the grace of God. You gave us forgiveness when we deserve death. You gave us wholeness when we deserve brokenness. And God, we will open up our mouths and we declare that you are good, that you're holy, that you're righteous, that you're perfect. And Lord, we thank you today for your goodness. And we just say this morning that we're here for you today, God. We're here for you, Lord. We're here for you, Jesus. We're here for you. Come on, let's lift it up.
morning, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, I want the team to throw up the QR code and the, and the number on the screen for us. Today, if you made a decision for Christ, we want to invite you to text the number on the screen or scan the QR code. And what that's going to do is help us follow up with you. If you made that decision and when I was saying, hey, I, I want to follow Jesus, I need that, I need that freedom. I want, to, I want our team to be able to help you in your faith journey. So the, they'll leave this up as we are dismissed today. You can just scan that or uh, text that number and our team will follow up with you. Church family, I'm so thankful for you. I'm proud of you. I'm thankful for what God is doing in our church and our church family. And I truly believe that the best is yet to come. God bless you. We'll